Welcome to the USA section of the International College of Dentists Outstanding Leaders Series. Today I'm honored and privileged to have with us Rear Admiral Deshanka V. Kleinman. She's the Public Health Director, Chief of the Corps, and the Deputy Director of the NICDR. Welcome. Now, Deshanka, what's the NIDCR? To help everybody do that. Well, you know, it's always, we're in Washington and there's acronyms. So it's the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. We added the craniofacial portion just a few years ago to explain why the institute is broader than just dentistry and dental and includes basically the whole structures around the mouth. Well, I'm glad you, you uh, said that to me because sometimes I mess that up. I'm used to the NIDR me too. acronym. Now, we've got <laughs> a lot we want to talk about, and I'll tell you, this is a privilege for me to be able to sit here and interview you. As, as we both know, you are also an interview in this series, and I, I just think that it's an honor for me to be here because I think you're just the greatest woman dentist in the United States. Now, it's tough for you to respond to that, I know. That's true. But we want you to loosen up, let us have it, and uh, let's start right way back. Where were you born? Well, I was born in what used to be uh, Podkoran, Yugoslavia. Right now, that part of Yugoslavia is called Slovenia. So it was a little village that's in the area one mile from Austria and Italy. And my family used to have a summer home there. And my parents were on vacation. I was born in, during the summer. So now, how did how did your family um, and you come to the United States, and when was that? It was before the country was open, as you know. Uh, Yugoslavia, after World War II, was behind the Iron Curtain. Um, it wasn't open uh, until a little bit later, and my parents had a real desire to leave, and we basically escaped by walking over the border. Um, with another family. My parents carried me um, and walked over to Italy. And we ended up spending time in Italy in a refugee camp and then in Germany and uh, emigrated over to Canada. So that now that you're a U.S. citizen, mm -hmm. you really appreciate what the United States is all about. Believe me, I think we all appreciate what the United States is all about. And in fact, the United States was our ultimate goal, but uh, there was a quota in the United States at that time mm -hmm. when we were coming over, and that was one of the reasons we ended up going to Canada. We spent nine years in Canada, and then ultimately were able to relocate to Chicago. To Chicago. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's talk about uh, your mom and dad. Right. Uh, they brought you to Canada. How about brothers and sisters? Are there... I have two younger brothers, one of whom was born in Canada while we were there, Alexander, and another brother who was born in Chicago, Andrew. And both of them are lawyers. Um, they practice yeah. and do different things with their you know, expertise in law. But we had a saying in our family that as my parents moved around from country to country, there was another sibling. So well, if they moved one move more time, we would have had a fourth. <laughs> well, now, Tell me about those days of your youth. Uh, Mom and Dad were, um, of course, they were. They, you you went through a very traumatic time getting to Canada mm -hmm. and down the United right. States. But were those pretty nice days, pretty happy days for you as a little girl? Oh, I think they were terrific days. Um, actually, uh, both my parents are veterinarians. My father went on to get a Ph.D. in physiology. My mother, who had started veterinary school in Yugoslavia, restarted and finished her training in veterinary medicine while we were in Canada. So while I was in elementary school, she was in school, and we would be doing our homework in the evening at the dining room table. Um, we lived in Guelph, Ontario, which, is a, which at that time was a very small town outside Toronto uh, with a lot of the winter sports. And uh, it was a wonderful time. And my grandparents lived with us, which was sort of the pattern at that time with the nuclear family, you know, being in this under the same roof and... Are your mother and you know, father still alive? Or my they? mother is still uh -huh. alive and a very, very strong matriarch of the family. She just yeah. had her 80th birthday. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Well, that, th those, those kind of stories are just amazing to me because, of course, I was born in a little town in Ohio and didn't have all that excitement 
uh, that you had. Now, let's talk about the early days of getting youth into college mm -hmm. and starting you in toward of this profession of dentistry. How did that all happen? <laughs> well, I went to uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, after high school, and during that time, I realized I really enjoyed the sciences. I majored in zoology and enjoyed the different things that that field had to offer. And as I contemplated with my parents, because you know, you mm -hmm. listen to your parents at one time, sure what are some of the options? We were looking at dentistry and medicine and, and even law. And there was a distant relative that we had in our family back in Yugoslavia that was in dentistry, and so I thought maybe this is an opportunity um, to take a look and see this particular profession. So I focused on that when it was my junior year in uh, college and decided that that would be the field that I would pursue. So then back to Chicago for dental school. And then back to Chicago for, to University of Illinois, back mm -hmm. home, living at home and going to dental school. It was a real um, I think a very important part of anyone's life when you go through college and you take your sure. next steps and and then move forward into a professional career. I was just ecstatic to be able to move into dental school and, and have that opportunity. Were those good days and did you have mentors that were directing you or sort of confidants that you could rely on to be uh, honest with what was happening? Well, what I didn't realize, you know, coming from an Eastern European background, how women were very active in all the fields, all the professions. I was a little bit taken aback when I started dental school and noticed that there were very few women in dental school overall. There was one other woman in my class, and fortunately women, maybe there were four women in the whole four years when I started as a freshman and Ronna Cohn being one of them. Um, and so the women would have an opportunity. Our sort of locker room was the ladies' <laughs> bathroom because we weren't allowed in the Sorry. men's locker room, the student locker room. And so we had a good support system from that perspective. We had a few women uh, professors and leaders, uh, one of whom was Elaine uh, Stubner, who was an oral maxillofacial surgeon, mm. and it was an amazing time to uh, be there as things were being changed, not only in dentistry and medicine for both women and men, yes. but also just the whole shift. This was 69 to 73, you know, after the war on poverty had been unfolded, the Vietnam War, you know, changes on campuses. Sure. Well, now, the woman issue, I was, I was several years ahead of you, and we had no females in our, in our dental school. Uh, we had some foreign people that, uh, when I say foreign, I don't mean Yugoslavia necessarily, but that were, um, were coming across to try to relicense themselves in the faculty. Now, once you were in dental school, and those were good years, funny years, other than the, the, the sort of being a real minority yeah. in school, I think they were very good years. I mean, it was a time when we had opportunities to work out in the community. We had um, outstanding programs at the University of Illinois in the area of craniofacial anomalies. Um, it was as anyone's time during that early phase of one's yeah. life in the yeah, early in 20s, you know, a time of exploration and excitement. So from there you felt you should go into a little more training and you went to Zoller? Is that the right well, sequence? Or that's right. Yeah. That was the right sequence. I had uh, thought at that time that it would be very important to proceed with a more extensive hospital-based training. And I was fortunate to get into the Zoller dental program, which had been in existence for a long time. And at that time, these programs were called rotating dental internships. Yeah, now these were the yeah. general practice yeah. residencies or the one-year residency. And uh, for me, it was an important time to try to take a look at the integration of, of dentistry within the broader healthcare delivery system. Because in dental school, you are set, 
in more of a private practice setting. And we were fortunate when I was in dental school to have moved from our older building into a new building. And we really had a very modern setup. Uh, so you could experience what it was like to practice in an office. So I went on to uh, Zoller and spent a year there. And we rotated uh, you know, through anesthesiology and through radiology and oral surgery and general practice so and pediatrics. And that's associated with the University of Chicago, is it? It's the University of Chicago okay. program. And it was affiliated with several of the hospitals in the area, Larabita and Weiler. And, and so you got exposure to special needs populations. And you definitely got exposure to the emergency room. Oh we were on call. We did the every third night with um, you know, the plastics residents and the ENT residents. So uh -huh. we rotated. So after that, though, you still felt you wanted some more education. Well, after that, um, I had the good fortune of, ha of meeting a young man who I had met when I was uh, still in dental school. And uh, he was on his way to Boston for his residency program from California. And I was looking to see how we could spend some time together. But at the same time, I had the good fortune of meeting Tony Jung, who at that time was an associate dean at Harvard Dental School, associate dean of admissions. And he told me about the options of what he thought would be new areas for dentistry, including dental public health, which had been around a long time, mm. but I hadn't really thought of it. So through friends, we connected in. And I thought I would apply to some specialty programs in Boston so that my hopeful husband-to-be, while he was doing his residency, uh, we would be both in, in training together. And uh, with Tony Jung's help, I applied for a NIDR at that time, a National Institute of Dental Research fellowship, training fellowship, which was called the National Research Service Award and was fortunate enough to get it to pay for my training, which I had in Boston University in dental public health. And Tony became the director, moved from Harvard to Boston, and I became one of his first students. Well, let's now that you did mention it, you went to Boston for sort of an ulterior motive of <laughs> being able to um, get a lot of face Always, time with this young fellow. Double, yeah. Let's talk about him a second. Tell me about him. Oh, he's a wonderful young man. Um, we've now been married 30 years. His name is Joel Edward Kleinman. And uh, he is a psychiatrist and a neurologist and has a PhD in neuropharmacology. Um, he's been in school a long time. Uh, but he was there to do his psychiatry residency. And uh, so we... No, I, I, I just... I just one of my objectives yeah. was met. Well, I listened to <laughs> Maybe both of the my brain power of you two, and I, <laughs> and I know you have some girls, and I said, boy, those girls must be really brilliant. Women. We've got two women. Two women. They're now women. <laughs> Tell me about those uh, young ladies and what they're doing now and where, the, where they went to school. Well, we have two daughters. We're blessed with two daughters. Alexa is our oldest. She's 25, and she recently finished her master's in social work at Columbia University and is now working. Um, at the uh, oh, major hospital in Manhattan in geriatric psychiatry wow. at Bellevue, which is really the kind of hospital that you probably see in any county hospital. Yeah, big one. And uh, we're really impressed. She is uh, an amazing young woman who really focuses on addressing the needs of individuals that really need help from friends, family, and mm. guardians, and colleagues. God bless her. And, uh, Jessica is finishing up her undergraduate at University of Wisconsin. Both girls went to University of Wisconsin. Just like mom. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. We're badgerettes. Just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and she's majoring in women's studies. So we'll be going to her graduation shortly. And then You're she's. proud of those girls. I am. Yeah. We are very proud of these well, women young now, women. I'm sorry. Young yeah, women. Uh -huh. Started off as pretty little <laughs> girls. Well, now that you've got your family pretty well locked in, and Joel is at the public health, is at NIH. Yes, he's is at the National still. Institute of Mental Health, mm -hmm. and he's within the um, Clinical Brain Disorders branch, and is overseeing the neuropathology section. Okay, well, we I wanted to make sure we've we interjected that since you went to Boston for and we're very successful in your reason <laughs> for going. 
Now let's let's if you leave Goldman and and uh, what did you decide to do then? Let, let's start at sequence because I want to get you to where you are now, but mm -hmm. I want I want to understand the steps in do, getting there. Right. And so. Well, I think at that time uh, the conditions of the National Research Service Award were that you had to do payback. That's not the case right now. Payback either to the government or to an academic health center. So. As a result of that particular award, I was looking um, towards doing one of those two things. Um, and one of uh, the areas we were moving, Joel had a commitment because he was a co-step in the public health service during medical school. And he had a payback. So he was coming back to the National Institutes of Health to do two years. And I said, well, it would be great if I could do something in the geographic area. And with good fortune, I had looked at several of the schools, and University of Maryland being one of them. And uh, Dr. Lee Joseph, uh, who became an excellent friend and colleague, hired me to work on a contract she had with the Public Health Service in training dental students and dental auxiliary students in extramural settings. It was the time of uh, the team program, mm -hmm. the training yes. in uh, uh, expanded auxiliary management. But this was a twist where we would take the same team where we'd have dental students, hygiene students, assisting students, and we would uh, work with them to work as a team to diagnose and plan and implement a program in the community. And she hired me to oversee that program. So for two years, I taught at University of Maryland uh, with her. And after two years, uh, we were going to reassess where we were going. We were going to move back to Chicago, where the family was. And at that time, Joel said, well, I think I need two more years. <laughs> and as a result, I said, well, maybe I'll try something different since I'll, I'm in the area of public health. Why don't I try to work with the public health service? And I was exploring things along that line. And Rudy Michik, Dr. Rudy Michik, who actually oversaw the contract that I was working on in several schools, he had a position and he hired me into what was then the Division of Dentistry in the Health Resources Administration, which was one part of the what public year health was service. That, was that in the late this 70s? was 78. 78. Mm -hmm. okay. So then I started working with him in the area of preventive dentistry and epidemiology and expanded functions. Were you commissioned in the public health service at then, that point? That's right. Then I became commissioned. I had applied to the public health service actually when I was in dental school because I wanted to do one of the public health service internships. At that time, the public health service had hospitals yes. throughout the country. Yes. And what I had done at University of Chicago was available through the public health service. But I was a permanent resident. I was a Canadian resident still at that time and was not eligible. Oh. So I then naturalized in my senior year of dental school, but too late for the public health service. And then I had all of my application and clearly my citizenship had already been passed and I was able to become commissioned in the commission corps. I, I, I recall you made captain in about 11 years which is very quick, incidentally, having had a little experience in the uniform services yeah, myself. A little bit. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about some of those great duty stations during that time mm -hmm. as you were being promoted up through and, and getting different challenges mm -hmm. within the public health corps. Um, well, I was very fortunate. Um, the mentors and the leaders in the public health service dental category were amazing at that time that I entered. Um, John Green, who was not only the chief dental officer, but the deputy surgeon general with Julie Richmond at that time was a real um, guide and mentor to me in terms of the whole public health service. But Dave Scott, when I came to the National Institute of Dental Research, my was the dean. director. My That's right, dean, yeah. your dean, you know. Yeah. And he, of course, had grown up in the public health service and seen. And when I was at University of Chicago, Bob Likens was the director. And Bob was one of the original members of the National Institute of Dental Research okay. before he went back to Chicago to head the residency program. So 
those early years, I was surrounded by sure. leaders who were commission corps officers, Hirsch Horwitz and his whole team, when you take a look at who was around at that time. Um, so the role of a young officer, the role of someone new to the federal fold was really nurtured through the um, existence and the vision of these leaders. So I was fortunate during that time to have had a variety of uh, experiences. I started off at NIDCR with uh, a role in planning um, and evaluation under the leadership of Dr. Lois Cohen, who headed the office at mm -hmm. that time. And uh, through her support, I was able to take incrementally more responsibility. But I remember Dave Scott gave me a um, an envelope opener. I guess this is now an antique. Who opens envelopes anymore? Maybe you open your email. But it said, uh, no amount of planning can replace dumb luck. This was his, <laughs> uh, because I was the planning officer. And with that sense of humor, he was able also to provide a lot of guidance. I recall Dave was a very, very, comp uh, a person of compassion. Oh, and he was definitely. Just, uh, now, let me, I, I know this is a little irregular, but I, uh, I have a list of some honors and awards, and I know you won't probably fess up to these things, but uh, I've just outlined a few that I'd like to read. Uh, the John W. Nixon Distinguished Service Award in Dental Public Health, mm -hmm. the Carl M. Schlack Award for AMSIS, the Distinguished Service Medal for Exemplary and Innovative Leadership in Contributing and Directing to the Development of the First Ever Surgeon General Report on Public Health, which I'd like to refer to a little later. University of Illinois School of Dentistry Distinguished Alumni. The Lewis Tab Taylor Award, American Association of Women Dentists. Now, I have a paper here of about 50 of these things, and, and it's hard to, uh, to brag on yourself, but you have been just magnificent in uh, receiving awards well-deserved through our profession. Mm -hmm. Now, do any of those stand out in your mind? I know that you, people like to contribute their awards to others around them that have earned them for them, but uh, in this case, I think that you earned them. And uh, do, do any of these particularly uh, come close to your heart or, or laughs about them? Or, uh, I mean, they're tickets and they're just wonderful things that have yeah. uh, responded to uh, wonderful career so far. Uh, I got a lot more I could read if, you, if, you, if that doesn't turn you <laughs> no. on. Let me, let me talk about it. No, that's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I, um, I've been deeply honored by all the awards. There's no question about that. Um, and you're right. What I'm going to say is what others say, but it's more true in public health than in any other area. There is no way that um, a single person could be responsible for the achievements uh, that are in the public health arena. It is something that doesn't fit in. You know, public health by nature is a team effort. Mm -hmm. It's not an individual effort. And so I've been fortunate to have been at the right place in the right time with the right leadership around me, with the right opening of the various uh, opportunities in order to be able to contribute. So when I take a look at these, I'm definitely honored by those that come from the, my peers. Of course. And, um, and also honored in the family of those who have come before. But I see them as, as representing you know, the contributions of everyone else that I've worked for. There really is not one thing that I've done in my life that I've done alone. That's right. And that's why I like public health, <laughs> because you continually can change your, um, your vista, your relationships, your interactions, and you're continually stimulated because you more and more are realizing how important other sectors are. When I started off, the focus was on health, and so I had the opportunity to move ahead with all the health professions as you started working with them, whether it's in a hospital setting, as you've mm -hmm. been in, or whether it's in a community setting. 
but more and more through time the importance of working with the education sector, the social service sector, the policy sector, you realize you can't put any limit on what you need to put together as your team, as your group, in order to address the things that need to be addressed to improve the nation's oral health. So. Well, you have always, I'm certain, have always made your boss look good. So that was, that's the that's way we do that. That's important, don't you that. think? That's right, we always do that. <laughs> now, you're the boss. You are the chief of the Commission Public yeah. Health Dental Corps. I think it'd be interesting just to give us a quick synopsis of what that core is and its functions. Well, as you know, the public health service itself is the uh, one of the seven uniform services and has evolved from the merchant marines. We had provided care as a core to the merchant marines. And the dental category is one of 11 categories in it. We have uh, 6,000 officers in the overall Corps, and the dental component is about 500 officers. So, in fact, I think our very first Commission Corps dentist was trained by an Army dentist when we first got started. But our service um, incrementally over the years had uh, been asked to provide care to different populations, Native American populations, Bureau of Prisons, even the veteran population before the establishment of the Veterans Administration, um, immigrants, HIV AIDS, etc. So our officers are actually stationed not only within the public health service in the different agencies like the Indian Health Service and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, NIH clearly and FDA and others, but also with the Coast Guard, which is now in the Department of, um, of Homeland Security, and also with the Bureau of Prisons and the Department of Justice. Um, so what it entails as a chief dental officer is twofold. One is sort of overseeing in a virtual way um, the welfare of our officers within the context of the overall Commission Corps, but it also entails being advisor to the Surgeon General on issues related to oral health, and then in turn to the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Secretary of the Department, but to be an interface between the Department and the Commission Corps and the outside organizations, whether they be professional organizations or voluntary organizations on issues that are confronting the nation with a predominant focus on addressing the needs of underserved populations. Well, you look awfully good in that uniform, and it's, it's a special thing. <laughs> it's one comfortable. Of, one of the greatest <laughs> privileges of a person's life, in my opinion, is to wear the uniform to serve their country, mm -hmm. and you're doing that very well. Thank now, you. let me uh, let me sort of change over. With that job, you also are the deputy director of the NIDCR. Uh, working for Larry Tabak. At this point, you've been through how many directors? Oh, I started with Dave Scott. Okay. So. And I've worked, uh, John Goggins was uh, acting director, Harold Lowe, Hal Slapkin, and now Larry. So quite a few. Of how the has that changed? You've, you've got a good perspective mm -hmm. of being there uh, several years. Right. What is the change that you years. well? <laughs> but you're kind. <laughs> what are the what are the perspectives and the changes and you see in the even in the mission of the uh, NIDCR? Well, the changes have evolved in the opportunities that science has brought to bear. The focus, the fact that the Dental Institute was part and parcel of the first three institutes that established the National Institutes of Health after World War II is a critical fact yes. in and of itself. And a role that was played, a leadership role that was played by the dental profession in creating this particular entity so that the science becomes the basis of our profession. Over the years that I've been at NIDCR, um, what has happened is the strength of our basic science, because NIDR in its initial phase was established as an intramural program first for a year or two before our extramural community evolved. 
And that particular opportunity of moving the basic science into now clinical research opportunities is what has evolved over time. And as been said over and over again, the opportunities that our knowledge base is providing in the interaction of the oral, cavity, dental diseases, and their impact on general health and well-being, one of the big messages of the Surgeon General's report, is continuing to open the opportunities and the challenges for dental research. And so the movement of the institute into areas such as clinical research, clinical research networks, as we have discussed recently, but also in addressing the needs of underserved populations through the establishment of our centers for oral health disparities research are important directions that have evolved over time. You mentioned a very critical uh, report that I know that uh, you had some major input into the oral surgeon's report. Uh, just uh, reflect a little bit on that uh, report. And that's been several, it's 2000? 2000, 2000 was when it was yeah. released. Um, it's Oral Health in America, um, and it's the Surgeon General's report. I think we were very fortunate with this report. This was a report that was commissioned by the Secretary of the Department, Secretary Shalala, and she at that time was convinced by her private dentist, Dr. John Drum, to look critically at the area of oral health and to learn more about what the relationship is between oral health and general health and well-being. And so with her urging, this report was generated, and then it was released under the leadership of Surgeon General Satcher. But the report opportunities was as much the process of putting the report together as the product that the report has, because it brought together the science base in which we sit within our profession. It was larger, the report was larger than dentistry in that it looked at the whole area of oral health and it looked at what the gaps were in our knowledge, what the opportunities are, what the opportunities are but it also laid out a framework for a national plan and that was used as a springboard to establish what we now have under Surgeon General Carmona's leadership um, and a public-private partnership with outside organizations, a national call to action to promote oral health, which highlights five major actions that we need to take in order to improve the nation's oral health. But the report established, the bottom line was that we have made tremendous gains in this country. We have tremendous opportunities and tools for disease prevention in our most common diseases. But there remains an incredible proportion of our population that hasn't benefited from some of the yes. knowledge base or the prevention and there's still much more to learn. So with that message, one good and one an imperative for action, I think it has opened the door and opened the eyes and the witnessing of what we need to do yet as a profession for the nation's health and for global health as well. And that is one of the impetuses that you're having to develop through the NIDCR right now. NIDCR and is a key player, key player. In, in the science-based development for the next steps and the next generation. Uh, key players also include the CDC, the Health Resources and Services Administration, the Indian Health Service, all of the agencies. But as important is the role that the private practice of dentistry and the voluntary organizations and the third party payers because they are all coming right. together under this umbrella of needing to and wanting to work together to address issues related to oral health. Yes, and so how important that is, those of us that had the opportunity to, uh, to see boots come into the services and would see the uh, the neglect that some of these kids still had, even though in, yeah. the, in the world which we think is wonderful, there still are those people right. that uh, are not accessing the benefits that you and the public health service are trying to get to the world, and right. that's, that's magnificent. Let me, uh, let me interject here a couple of the things. Uh, I don't know how you have time 
doing those two jobs, because I know that the <laughs> time is extremely important. Uh, you also have been so, so um, strong in your willingness to share in public policy, but also in organizations. Let me just make sure I don't miss any of these. I want to make sure. <laughs> American Association of Public Health Dentistry, you were the president of that. American Association of Women Dentistry, Dentist, you were the president of that. The American Board of Dental Public Health, you were the president of that. I've got a list here of just myriads of different organizations which you have shared your time and probably a lot of it leisure time to serve our profession. And of course, one of the main areas I would like to just for you have you discuss, because I think you're one of the major pioneers in the women dentists, the American Association of Women Dentists. As I relate back in dental school, there were no women dentists, even though in Europe they were all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could feel very proud. I understand that uh, the, uh, the number of females assessing into dental schools now in the freshman class is 50% or so. You, you know those statistics far better than I. How gratifying that must be to be a person that's helped build that through the years. Well, I think that um, we're fortunate as a country to be able to open up the doors okay. to anyone, you know, within our country who wants to enter the field of dentistry and benefit from it and contribute to it. The women um, have been major players. And actually, the association, the American Association of Women Dentists, or was initiated in the 20s. And so it's not a relatively new organization, mm -hmm. but it played a role like many other organizations in establishing a basis for social interaction, for support of a group of professionals emerging in the field that needed each other in order to move forward as professionals and as dentists. And I am delighted I really am delighted to see that. We now need to move ahead and increase the proportion of individuals from different race and ethnicities within our dental profession. And that's an area that I think we need to focus on as a profession more and more. Yeah, because it's, it's great that from an old timer that's out of the profession, really, to watch the number of young, um, they were at that time young girls, that are now practicing women in the profession is just magnificent. Uh, some of which uh, I feel that I've had some impact on their lives of just uh, encouragement. Um, let's talk about it, several other things. I know that you have you've been very active in the uh, Associate, American Association of Dental Research and the International Association of Dental Research, and the number of publications you have uh, with yourself and other. Uh, co-investigators is just phenomenal. Uh, of course, you're in a place where that just must be great. Are there any areas of of investigations that you have published? I know you're an editor. You've been a, a co-editor, or I guess, what do you call it, contributing editor of the Journal mm -hmm. American Dental Association mm -hmm. for years. Are there any of those areas that are special to you, that you're your favorites, uh, that you've done research on and have published uh, heavily on? Well, one of the areas that I think, um, looking back, is the area of opening up the, um, and enlarging the issues related to the study of oral pathology, oral mucosal pathologies. And I had the good fortune of spending some concentrated time uh, with Dr. Jens Pinborg. And he had come over to uh, NIDR at that time and provided us guidance with some of the studies that he had been doing in countries throughout the world uh, with a focus on cancer as well as other mm -hmm. pathologies at a time when HIV AIDS was just emerging. So we were there in the early 80s, the mid 80s, and he helped us launch the Walter Reed Longitudinal Study. Yeah, good stuff. And he also helped guide our participation in the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, adding an oral mucosal oral pathology um, component to it and to one of our NIDR surveys for children and adults. So that particular area of research was of extreme importance, I think, to all of us in public health and in practice because so long we've been focused on 
the heart tissues, the teeth. And we haven't looked at all of the reflection of the oral cavity and its impact. And that's when you start opening up not only issues of diet, but other um, systemic disorders where basically the mouth becomes and is and maintains um, the role as a mirror of your overall health. And so this particular area of research, whether it was uh, at that time early indicators of HIV infection or mm -hmm. indicators of progression from HIV to AIDS, um, or indicators of substance abuse or any systemic disease or condition, um, it opened up, I think, the opportunity for us to look at our area of the body in a more comprehensive manner. And you have been very articulate as a speaker around our country and internationally mm -hmm. about the perspectives of oral health in our future. Mm -hmm. I know you too, in that in the Surgeon Generals. Now, recently you have been asked to do something even more different, maybe, different. Uh, uh, at the NIH. Mm -hmm. And maybe you would just uh, give me a short dissertation on what you've been doing for the past several months. Yeah. Well, I've been working with the um, National Institutes of Health, uh, Dr. Elias Arhuni, our director, has launched an initiative called the NIH Roadmap for Medical Research. And it is an initiative that's a collective effort of all the senior leadership of NIH with you know, a large number of stakeholders from all over the country in various fields. And it is designed to address what are seen as roadblocks to the conduct of research, whether it's dental research or research related to cancer or diabetes, any area of research, um, and roadblocks that are uh, blocking our ability to transfer research findings into practice. And so these initiatives, I serve as a coordinator to uh, implement and facilitate the implementation of these initiatives are designed all the way on one side to provide all, any researcher with tools and technologies to accelerate their research. Um, they're pursuing areas of uh, bioinformatics and computing and nanomedicine to um, areas that are going to facilitate interdisciplinary research, such as the areas um, that we do in dentistry. I mean, dentistry has really been in the forefront of interdisciplinary research with the issues of working together with um, chemists, with various uh, economists, with uh, individuals in various fields of material mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. um, we have been in the forefront. And then lastly, but most importantly, the whole area of re-engineering the clinical research enterprise, trying to see what we can do to integrate existing clinical research networks in order to be able to maximize the infrastructure. So for example, the clinical research networks that we've just established in dentistry for dental research are envisioned in the future to be able to connect in with other research networks. And similarly, we're looking within this roadmap for medical research ways to integrate the community-based provider, whether it's the physician, the dentist, or the nurse, into the clinical research spectrum so that they can be the front lines of clinical research, recruiting patients and being the first ones to transfer the research findings to the folks in their community. So you don't have to wait 20 years. Why didn't we think of that before? But we didn't. Let but it's me, exciting. I know you have a, you've had an interest in the elderly also. Mm -hmm. um, since the whole population of the United States is getting older, uh, we call, I don't like to say senior citizens, I call it chronologically advantaged. Um, but um, tell me uh, what you see the dental profession doing in that area. Well, I think some of the, um, several things. One is clearly the elderly give us the opportunity of putting all aspects of the entire organism together because what you do in managing and maintaining oral health is going to help them with all aspects of their general health. So that's number one. It was going to make the, the profession be much more attuned to comorbidities in interacting with a whole range of specialists in the medical profession and in the dental profession 
and it will challenge us to be much more able to be counselors and to listen because I think there's a whole different interaction with someone who is more mm -hmm. mature in their years. You have thank to you. listen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I think we both have it. So from a professional point of view, um, the shift in the demographics of our population is a challenge and we have to be prepared for it. We have to be prepared for special needs populations and ensure that we are competent, have the confidence to, to work with individuals with special needs, of which there are a greater proportion in the elderly as well. And we're seeing that some of the changes in our legislative base are trying to open up the reimbursement doors so that oral health is seen as medically necessary and that the dental service is provided to individuals in those very special years of life are reimbursed appropriately. So things are coming together, I think, when we take a look at it. And in, through the wise generation, um, I think that the profession is going to grow as well. I ask a question of uh, several people. My grandson, who's 16, is talking about going into dentistry, and he knocks on your door. What do you tell him? He said, Dr. Klein, I'd like to be a dentist. Should I be? What's it doing out there today? Well, you know, I've always thought um, that as you look back at, at your career and you look forward, the answer definitely is yes. Definitely move through that door and enter this field because what the field is today can be exciting to you. But what the field is going to be tomorrow yeah. is yet to be created and discovered. And not only do we have diversity in what one can do as a dentist today, but tomorrow the opportunities for dentists to be leaders for oral health, overseeing all other health professions, all these other sectors and be able to really make magnitudes of improvement mm -hmm. are incredible. And so I'd say to your grandson, I hope he goes into dentistry, definitely yes. Well, I'm going to tell him that. Tell him I, that. I like to keep reading it because Grandpa's to, uh, always the one. Text now, message him with that. Uh, let me ask you this what, What's uh, down the road for Tushanka Kleinman? And her, your career is super. You can probably stay there for a long time. Other things in mind? Uh, you don't have to fess up totally. I mean, it's up to you. But uh, what, do you, what do you see in the next mm -hmm. several years for you? Well, I think um, I hope I can continue to be and play a role that's contributing to overall health. I have always an interest to make sure that I am able to be at the public health portion of the table. It may not be in public health settings overall. So as much as I've had the opportunity to work in a variety of organizations uh, in academia and in the federal sector, um, there are opportunities at the local community as well. So my eyes are open, uh, but the goal's the same. Um, if there's opportunities for me to play a role and contribute to public health, that's where I'd like to be. Well, I think you'll be there. Knowing, <laughs> An indirect uh, answer. <laughs> knowing you, you'll be where you want to be because yeah. you, you've got the energies, you've got the willingness to serve, you've got all of those leadership capabilities. You've proven it by your uniform, you've proven it by your jobs. And, and I, just, uh, I just want to say thanks. Well, thank you. This has been special. Well, you're special. I really appreciate God it, bless. Dick. Thank you very much. Thanks.